Good. What's up, everyone? Uh, I'm just going to ask one person to comment if you guys can hear me okay. We always have little issues with sound. You will not believe how hard it is to set it all up. There's too many moving parts. Uh, one question, and we're going to get going right away. Well, good morning, everyone. I just want to one answer, one comment that you guys can hear me okay. And audio is good. Loud and clear, Maurice Harrison says. Thank you, guys. All right. Uh, happy Tuesday, everyone. My name is Dmitry. This is Business Hats Podcast. I'm here sitting with my friend for over five years now, Dan Young. Uh, he is from Iowa. Yes. A couple hours from here. Drove snowy roads just to be with you guys. Uh, you about to hear some fire stories because Dan Young has been wearing business hat for how long? 21 years. 21 years. My first question to you is, how long does it take to build a brand? <laughs> I, 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 knew, I knew that was going to be your first question. <laughs> you know, I think the first five years you're, you're, you're building. Hold on. Uh, keep it a little bit closer to yourself. Um, yep. Right here? What, a couple inches. Is yeah. that better? Yep. Yes. I think the first five years, you know, you're defining yourself. At least we were, you know, and. And it got brought up to me. My first logo was blue and red. It looked like a Band-Aid. <laughs> it was, uh, but you know, it was what I could afford at the time. I think it was 150 bucks, and they stuck it on this old van. 150 is a lot for a logo, especially well, at that time. At that time. It was both doors, though. On, okay. On a big water department van that was blue. And, and I think it was somebody pointed out, they said, uh, that looks like a big Band-Aid. I said, well, that's not good, you know. And, um. I went, actually, that's kind of interesting because that's where we came up with our color. I went to a sign people. They're still my, they're still the company I use, uh, Ledoux Signs. And I went to him and they were, we were, we were trying to pick out a new logo because I had that time gotten a couple of trucks. And he says, he says, everybody gets red, black, blue. He says, why don't you do something different? He says, what colors do you like? And I said, well, I like Harley Davidson orange. And so we went orange and black, orange and black and white. And since that time, that's what it went. That's our colors now. Love it. I would like to set up the tone for this podcast today. I want to talk about branding. I want to talk about our industry. I want to talk about sales because in the roofing industry, uh, in the roofing business, you can wear one of the five, six hats. You can wear sales hat. You can wear branding hat. You can wear admin. You can, you can wear all the hats that you want. And last week, you actually were part of, uh, of it, I believe. We have a pretty heated discussion online yeah. on Facebook. People were, um, jo Joey, I think, came and he was just making a claim that uh, I focus too much on retail. And I do. Like, you know, for seven years in the roofing business, I wear a retail hat more than any other hat because I love branding. I love when my phone rings. And I know you have similar path. Uh, and so many people replied and said, yes, you absolutely can build a brand. You don't have to storm chase. Let's talk about storm chasing versus branding. Let's talk about uh, how long does it take and why so many people in the roofing industry don't understand the branding, but go after storms, door knocking. Is it because it's easier? Is it because it's low hanging fruit or why is it? You know, it's interesting because when I started out, I didn't know door knocking, storm restoration. Do I, you do now? I, oh, I do now. I'm <laughs> very good at it. And uh, the thing about it is, is you can have both. You don't, you don't have to have just one. Both are good mm -hmm. if they provide income and you provide a service. I, I do think, you know, and I always have, when I first started going to conferences, I'd see these guys and they would be all door knockers you know, tons of people and, and big companies. And, and I used to think, well, maybe I should go that direction. And it was about a year or two into it that I says, no, you know, I want to be a storm catcher. That's what I call myself. I'm a storm catcher. And, and the reason I like that is I can do retail. Um, being able to have my sales guys do a retail bed versus, a, you know, knocking all the doors. Now, all that said, when they were having that discussion, 
me and you talked about that. And, 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 and I don't think that it's necessarily just one or the other. I think that you have to decide in your company what direction you're going to go. If, if, if you do well with door knocking, great. I, I believe you build a brand, and when a storm hits in your area, you take advantage of that. And, and that's what I've always believed. But um, so me and Lenny Scarola always talk about it. And Lenny always said that he loves door knocking because if he would lose everything today, he would go in any town, start door knocking, start generating sales, revenue. And I would say uh, my answer always have been that's the same reason I love branding. I can go create a YouTube video today, a Facebook video, start advertising <laughs> like at my sleep and make my phone ring. And everything I do is like that. Well, and, and think about it. This, uh, the pandemic, you know, uh, is a prime example. We were knocking on doors and, and I always hold the phone up here. The phone is the next generation. And I've always said this. When my kids want something, they ask Google, Siri. When I, as an adult, need something, I ask my phone. Where are you in that? And, and I ask that question legitimately to a storm chaser or a retail contractor. Where do you want to be? I, I can do geo-targeting in a neighborhood that got slammed by a storm. Sure, you can go knock doors. But if I'm already there, and my branding's already there, and my vehicles are just there, you know, we're, we're, we're going to take the neighborhood. A lot of the time, my favorite leads are, are leads that call in. Leads that call in should be closable most of the time. Oh, yeah. When you knock a door, I'm not saying it's a bad lead. We're in their neighborhood and there's storm damage. We're going to um, knock the neighbor's door. I mean, we will. Or they'll just come to us, which I prefer. But a lead that comes to you, I think, is a better lead than a knock. I always have. That's just my opinion. Some people will disagree. What's your best lead generation? What what's, what are the best leads that you have in your company? It's hard because I used to think I had an answer for that. I used to think it was, you know, um, we do a lot of geo-targeting now in a storm. We do a lot of, but if you're picking my... Facebook or Google or... All of it. All of um, I have in-house marketing. I have an in-house marketing girl that does it full-time. And then I also have... a videographer full-time. I'm probably one of the few that do now. Um, we just implemented that about a year ago. So we do all our marketing in-house. However, we have companies that track what we do. Mm -hmm. And I, I won't name them because sometimes we change those companies sure. on their track record. If they're doing a good track for us, then that's actually comes up every year. We, we analyze them. But what they do is they track everything that my company's doing. Phone calls, um, missed phone calls, leads they track my uh, crm they track everything and i'm able to see then okay how many hits am i getting on this ad was this a good ad was it a bad ad so split test everything Guy, it. guys this is going to be all lead generation marketing i mean if you cannot learn from guys like us I, I don't think you can learn this but i want you to ask questions anything lead generation anything branding in for me or but then ask your questions because we'll sit here as long as you have questions and we'll try to help you as much as possible because marketing is hard. And I would say it's getting harder and harder because it's getting saturated. A lot of players, a lot of platforms, everyone's changing, but it's doable and it's adaptable. But you have you are the one who have to adapt. You have do do you feel like you wear that marketing hat in your company? I feel like I've uh laid out a path for the people that we hire now. In the beginning, my wife was in radio for a long time. So she brought some of the marketing to me. When I was real small, I used to get a little bit of a deal on ads. Radio was popular before the phone and everything. So do you do radio now? Oh yeah. Yeah. My marketing is broad. We we cover how radio. many how many channels? How many total? Um we try to cover age demographic. Okay. So we try to cover um you know, certain demographic that we know that those people are either home buyers or possible purchasers of, of a home. Um, How much of the budget you give to radio, for example? We, we do an overall budget. So we take our numbers per year and we break it down into what we feel. We, we spend quite a bit on marketing, um, but there is markets that we spend more on and off. But I, in my local area on the radio, we saturate pretty good. And even then, when you're doing an ad, I'll touch on this because I think this is good for somebody that's maybe getting into this. If you can't afford to do everything in the beginning, 
we would target ads. So they charge you more for certain times of the day. Well, what times do you target your ads and what demographics? So what radio station matters? Would heavy metal? No, I, probably not. I'm just saying, you know, I'm going to target the middle family income. Uh, and then what time does your ad play? So you can choose these things. Mm -hmm. What time do people go to work? That's when I want my ad. What time do they come home? That's when I want my ad. What time do they have lunch? That's time I want to play my ads. And I do that with all social media. Got it. How do you track it? And how do you track results? How many leads per month? Give me an idea you're getting right now. Well, not right now, in the last few months. Yeah, it's right now. It's slow for us in the Midwest here. You know, it fluctuates. We get hundreds um, just off. We don't. My sales guys spoiled. don't have to knock it. They're spoiled. Yeah. And I, and I love them because they're, we're a team. All our sales guys are um, employees. How do you make your sales guys uh, accountable? Because y y your lead costs, what, 200 bucks, 250 bucks per lead? Um, if you break it down. If you broke it down into the numbers, um, I have a manager uh, who happens to be my sister-in-law. We have a lot of family in the company, too. And we, we keep you accountable. But a lot of it is if I see that you're getting too many leads, too much flow, and that you're dropping the ball, then I'm going to um, direct the leads in another direction, or she will. Um, I think it matters on, on when you see that too many leads are coming in, it's time to train in a new salesperson and divvy it up, which happens every year. Of course. So you try new things every, <clears throat> every month, every year. Can you name a few things that you've tried before that worked before but don't work anymore? Like what's dying? Well, they used to say what the, the mailers were dying. And, 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 and I, I know that there's that a change last year. <laughs> I know there's a few groups that, yeah, because of that, but I've always believed in it, but it cannot be in my opinion only when you saturate a neighborhood, I don't just do a geo targeting with Google. I do newspaper radio. I do postcards. Um, if my guys are in the neighborhood, we will actually, um, go to a neighborhood with our vehicles. They're all, um, 1500 Dodge Rams all identical. I don't do full wraps. I do partial young construction. Um, save, save and brand yes. New. And even, even my synthetic felt, all my synthetic felt is custom. I buy it by the container. Um, it's orange, pure fluorescent orange. So it sticks out a little. It sticks out, but it's also, it completes the branding because the they, branding. See, they see you in the neighborhood, they see the roofs, they see the vehicles, they go online, they see the image again. So now they warm to you. We had, uh, Tornado straight line winds this year in Mason City area. And the fire department was um, flying their drones and they were showing on the TV and everywhere you seen was orange. That's branding right there. Best money I ever spent. Love it. Yeah. Because you, if you're a homeowner and you in, are in an association or you're in a neighborhood and 70% of the roofs have that orange color, they already know who we are by that color. Mm -hmm. You're going to get the call. How is competition in your markets right now? Do you have a lot of storm chasers? Do you have out of town companies who come only? After? You know, it's funny because we were talking about this just uh, me and my wife were discussing this. I don't really look at at competition the same anymore. Um, I, I try to be a leader and try to be going in the direction that I think our company needs to go as a leader. And, and, and try to direct our people the same. Am I competitive? Yeah. You're competitive. I, I mean, we both, mm -hmm. I think in this industry, you know, you, nobody wants to drive by and see the competition sign in a, an association you've been messing with for a while, right? But, but I, I, I think that if I think about that too much, it's not. I need to focus on what I'm doing as a business owner and what I'm doing as a leader to guide the company forward, not... Do we have people come? Sure. I mean, the storm hits, you see them, you know, by then I usually try to have the orange tarps on the roof, right? You know? I see. We have a question, a couple questions. Uh, this one is, comes from growth evangel evangelist. Um, what's the CRM you're using to back your results? I know you're Oculinks guy. Um, you know, let's talk about CRM. So yeah, let's, let's discuss that. Cause we, this is one of my biggest, uh, things that I always see on what we, how many times do you see that I here's the thing about CRMs you will uh so there's like 10 CRMs right now 
and they all have haters and they all have lovers True. because the reality is it's not about CRM it's how you use it just like with any tool uh, you know just like with the websites like people say websites don't work mailers don't work it's how you work it it's what you do it's with it 100% and and you know we got AccuLinks and I'll tell you we got AccuLinks when when it first came out almost we were like one of their first I, and I got it from going to a conference so if you don't think a conference ever pays I take nuggets I don't no longer go to a conference and try to absorb 50 things. I pick 10 items and then I try to pick five items that I can implement. I like implemental items. And then you have your five items that would be long-term implementation. But the CRM we picked was AccuLinks. Um, we set it up. We set it up as a retail at first. Um, so we put our numbers in there and we were able to do retail bids. I think if your company's running whether you're doing storm or retail or you're just doing storm, your people should know how to put a bid together, whether or not you, you don't need the insurance work to be able to know the numbers. And I, I, I think, and that's about the only thing I ever what, say. What, what, okay. What, what's your answer to those roofers who's, uh, you know, who would not do the bid and always demand insurance paperwork? So do we, we work for insurance? We, we do. And, and to be honest, that's how we work. Sure. I'm going to lay it out. But, but they don't, but they uh, don't know even how uh, to put it together. Occasionally we bend the rule. I'm not going to say we never have. And there could be a reason that you should have to put a retail to bid together and your company should know how to put a retail bid together. It's, mm -hmm. you should know your number. And, and, uh, I try to make sure I, I'd like our numbers to be close to what we're asking for from insurance. Why shouldn't your number be the same as your insurance number? Why shouldn't insurance have a different number than your retail? Mm. I've always kind of, you know, have that balance. And your number should be based on what your company needs for profit, Charges. not what you make up for a claim. Absolutely. <clears throat> Obviously, I uh, actually want to give a huge shout out to Jeb Nimbus. Jeb Nimbus has been sp sponsoring and helping us for years. And I, I want to share this. Next week, December 5th to December 9th, I'm going on a cruise with the Jab Nimbus. Oh. And I have not had personal time off for over 10 years. Last time was 2012 World Cup. I went to Brazil for five nights. So like no kids. no. Because you need to understand, I have five kids. When I go on vacation for five, six nights, <laughs> it's a job. It's a work to go on vacation. And I've been burning out. I mean, with the uh, rescheduling conference and stuff. And about a week ago, Mark, a marketing director for Japanese, was messaging me. He's like, Misha, we're going. And I just love the company. And one of the reasons I've been endorsing them, not only because I was using them myself, but the biggest reason is because of the people. So they have three owners have been in their office. I just love their team. So they messaged me. He's like, hey, we have extra spot. Do you want to go on a cruise? I've never been on a cruise before. So I came home. I, I wanted to take my wife, but she's in the college. She couldn't make it. And I said, I've got to go. Like, I need time off, and this is perfect timing. Anyway, Jab Nimbus, I'll see you next week. And I'm just, I'm a Jab Nimbus fan. But it's not about Jab Nimbus, though. It's about any CRM that you picked, you can make it work. Yes, <laughs> that's huge. We were talking about this yesterday. And if you're going to have AccuLinks, Jab Nimbus, those are, I've never heard. I, I don't look at it that way. I'm, we, the reason that we're where we're at is because with a good CRM, that controls everything that you're doing in a company today. But I think that if you don't have that, you need to change it too, by the way. Your CRM is only as good as you're going. There's many times you got to go in and adjust. I you, mean, there's so, so many people start using CRM and they use like 5% of capacity. Yes. They, they use it for the calendar. I mean, you can honestly, if you're not using Japanese to make your people accountable, to make exceptional customer service for customers. I mean, you need to use it like doctors use it. When you call your doctor, uh, you know, it's always, it, it can be a brand new receptionist. But if you ask her, hey, do you know who I've seen last time? She'll tell you that two years ago, you've seen this doctor and he gave you that pres uh, pr prescription. The same with me, with my business. If, if, if someone r writes me negative review today and I did a business with him five years ago, I will go to my CRM. I will see who was the sales rep, where we late on the first appointment, who was the crew. I will give you all the answers within two minutes. What? Yes, we <laughs> we document everything. And, and let's let's touch on that because if you're going to build a brand, we mess up. What, of com course. what company don't? 
you try to make it right. But sometimes when you screw up, you can never make that person happy again. Let's be realistic about that. But that file has to document it. But in that file, if you call, it's in there. Yep. And I can go back 10, 10, over 10 years, and I can tell you what color shingle you picked. We even use that. So we use our CRM when we, we warehouse. I, I also have multiple warehouses, and I, I stock colors, shingles, um, felt, everything. Just because if there's a storm, I do use ABC. But if there's a storm, I'm prepared. I'm, I, I could roof an entire, an entire district. So I, I do that for a lot of reasons, but that's well, that's one of the big ones. Well, guys, give it a like if you like this content. Ask a question. We'll try to get as many as possible. Uh, Growth Evangelist, uh, second question is, what's an expected conversion on Facebook ads? I saw a massive drop in quality. Good luck with Facebook. W what's the conversion rate? I don't even know. I, I, you know, it, I'm going to touch on this. If you're start, there, there, There's two different ways to brand and two different ways to do your marketing. In the beginning, if you only have an X amount of money to do it, targeting and getting the most bang for your buck, even with what you do, you know that if I put a little more money here, we use Facebook a lot for uh, social media content. Um, we do, we have a program called YC Cares. We give back to the community. YC Cares is, uh, in essence, uh, a division of us that's always been there. We give away free roofs. We give away uh, Christmas $500 um, shopping sprees. And we do that because we, we felt a need for the community that if we're going to be branding and they're going to be hiring us. And, and, and I think that touches on the this a little bit different on what you were discussing. How do you do the branding? Well, it's not just, here's my hat. How do you get back to the community that's given you money? How do you, how do you get, um, I've done five, six family roofs. The reason they're calling is the service, you know, the quality and the branding they're, they're they're calling us because they feel comfortable what kind of <clears throat> content you put on the facebook that converts the most like the most engaging posts sometimes it's just uh you know it's funny because i always try to when i'm looking at facebook if i'm if you're looking at facebook it's always the ones that uh, come out with a the weird goofy stuff or, or something that's like a spin uh we'll we'll do uh what to, this year they did uh um turkey or ham just that simple. Wow. So we had people in the company with turkey or ham, a uh, pumpkin pie or apple pie, you know, and, and there were just questions that we were asking. So people nothing are, related to roofing. Most of the time no. <laughs> we, well, if it is, it, it, you know, we do use it for that, but no, um, it's the branding again. You'll have a, uh, you know, young, you'll have the employees talking about what their favorite dish is. Uh, At the end of the day, we're all humans some reason roofers feel like they have to post pictures of roofs yeah. or selfies on the roof. Like that, that's like the only thing I do think, you know, I mean, if I have an entire homeowners association, then I'm going to show some felt, <laughs> but, but you know, we even here, I got one. Yeah. we got these, they're dog biscuits and we give them away to homeowners that have dogs. Wow. So it's just a simple little thing. I don't know what they call us to be honest with you. But uh, no, I like it. It's, well, it's very smart to give something to the kid, to give something to. And I the, got a, one of my favorites, and I don't know. One of my favorites. We were talking about the branding. So that's the Pink Panther. I'm OC guy. Sure. And I, you know, I know you do your test on shingles, but yeah. you know, and and you could touch on that. I think, you know, we've been branded with OC for so long. I, I just it's who we are. And uh, but I had these little shirts made with Young Construction on them. Well, and so when, when the kids come out, we give these to them, you know, it's, it's just a different little thing. Now I, I'm not saying that branding is the solution to your quality control, or you still got to follow through with your company and do what's right. But, but I like how you said it's usually stuff. Here's my advice to everyone. Bring your family. Like I'll give you an example. Uh, yesterday, my dad passed an uh, interview um, to become a citizen, and I published it on a business page because it's big for me. Like, I'm a business owner, but I want my community, I want my people, anyone who would do business with me, I want them to know that I'm an immigrant. That will never change. I'm a family guy. I want, and I don't post a lot, I don't abuse it. But guess what? That picture had the highest like, uh, likes engagement rate in a long time because people care for it 
And think about this: when you um, when you search for a service provider, let's say you let's say you would be looking for a painter, and you go to his Facebook page or his website, and you see that that painter just had his dad from uh, Colombia. I don't know. Just how come? Like, what 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 what's your feeling? How that makes you feel? You feel like you're dealing with a real human. You feel like the, you know you have you have sympathy you have empathy you have yes. you have emotions towards it and every time you get someone's emotions you you're a little bit closer to do business with them and this is what we're going to remember at the end of the day that's what people remember about me i never was shy about showing my immigrant story as a matter of fact i was you know sh you know building off it like when my dad came here in 2015 i'm like hey my dad is doing my trailers now i was telling the story because people love it so find, don't try to be the best, especially in the Facebook. Try to be different and find what it is different. Like you can be, you can be anything. And when you're different, that's going to be a most engaging post. And to answer your question, the conversion rates on Facebook will be the most on those posts. I agree. I, I try to be human. Exactly. You know, bring in, bring in, you know, we're a family owned company and, and you have a lot of, uh, a lot involved in that. And I think very similar to what your, your brother just came um, mm -hmm. to the United States and, and what a blessing, you know, I, I think sometimes we get sidetracked here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it, every now and then we need to take a step back and realize this country we live in is, is a lot better than, than 100%. people, people want to tell us. And, and it's only when you discuss it with somebody from another place, another, another country, that you really get a grasp on how blessed we are. What country can you go to and start with? I started my company out of the back of a Chevy Impala 21 years ago. The muffler used to fall off. I used to put flyers up in grocery stores and you pull the tag. I remember. See, but but those those kind of stories, that's what people like. I Like if you publish that picture, like find the picture on the internet or go through archives, publish that picture, how it started, that's going to be most engaging. I still have that flyer. My wife printed it and put it on the fridge. And it was What's the last time you posted it? I haven't, but I'm going to do that. Exactly. Which, you know what's funny? I used to pull like three or four of the tabs to make it look like I was busy. <laughs> but see, that's the thing. You know? You 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 find something like that. I, I, I posted a pic. I found a picture of myself in 2005 wearing a belt where i mean that picture has like i don't know 600 likes where on average my post will get like 100 likes and i never chase likes but for me likes is uh like how you measure attention sure right so it's a split test so i published that picture and i couldn't believe the amount of comments i got like people are saying oh look at those skinny long arms those are working hands you know like and <laughs> who is that guy but it was awesome to to share because everybody can relate to it. Like, you know, you find a picture of you working 15 years ago, 20 years ago, first car, first, everyone has one. Well, it was your, your, I remember your story still when you were telling me you, you, you were having a rough spot and you went to, was it New York for the ice removal? Uh, Boston. Boston. But, yep. I remember that. I remember that story because I remember many times, you know, we're, if you're running a co company for 20, 21 years, I'm going to tell you that you you probably should be the last one to get paid throughout many <laughs> You're times. You're always the last one. Either and, sleep, and, and if you want to keep that company going, um, you need to learn real quick to pay attention to your numbers. And you need to also, you know, one of my biggest things, and I'm going to talk about my team. And I, I say my team, I don't consider, I don't want to be a boss. I want to be an, I don't like that word that much. I, I want to be a leader and I want to hire people. It took me a while because I'm kind of a control guy but i had to let go and let people take over the position and do it their way you know i'm able to leave now if i want to leave for a week i can leave i don't got to worry about anything i got great people in place and, and how, I, how hard was it to delegate that you can do that i think for people like driven people it's more about letting go and letting people fail and letting people find out on their own you know, no one's going to do it the same way. And you have to be okay with that. I, if you want to build a, a legitimate company that's going to be successful, you got to put the systems in place that the company will eventually run itself, whether you're there or not. 
you know, and start asking yourself, could I leave for two weeks? Could I leave for a month? And when the answer starts to be yes to those questions, you're in the right direction. When something's wrong, figure it out and put a system in place. It's like going from 1 million to 5 million. You know, I remember going from three to 5 million. I remember that to this day. And it was, it was very, very hard. You know, what was the hardest? I think the hardest is just managing the workflow, learning that you have to have systems in place to, to, to take care of that tidying up when you go from those numbers. And the same thing goes from five to 10, from 10 to 20, those numbers and those jumps. What are you going to do this year? Ah, oh, do I mention that? <laughs> uh, you know, this, I wasn't going to rant, but this year we're not as big as some of the companies that come here and I'm not ashamed of that. One of the things that I think gets left out is not so much as how many million, you know, because that's easy. I see a lot of people, you know, that I go to conferences and they do 30, 50 million dollars. And then two years, three years later, I don't see them. And, and I use that. And that does, some of them do really well and stay in business 10 years, um, make a hundred million. But, but most don't. But, but here's, it's true. <laughs> but here's the question I, I think that gets missed. I'm glad you actually asked. This is the question. How much are you making on your contracts and on your jobs? What's your, what's your net. numbers? What's your net? You know, it's, it, it, I have a guy, let's say that you're making $15 million a year. There's people that make 15 million a year that make the same as a guy doing 30 million a year. Sure. And the reason is, is he has a system. He has his numbers and he knows what he's doing. The other guy, you know, are you doing it for quota? There's companies that do a hundred million a year and, and they're living off on rebates because their percentages are so low. What do you think is the most profitable size for, for net? If I had to pick, because I've, I've been, sure. I, I would say anywhere from 15 to 20 million is really good. It's a honey spot. 15 to 20. That's, I like it. Now, if you're going to come in here and sell your company, if you're going to come in and, and, and build a company and you're younger, you know, I'm a little older. So this question would be answered, I think better by different age groups. So if somebody wants to build a company, that's a hundred million, you're going to have to dedicate a lot of time, 50 million. You're going to have to dedicate a, a certain amount of time and, I did anybody offer you to buy you out yet? Multiple times. Multiple times. Why didn't you sell? I have two two boys that are 14 and I have a girl that's uh, going to be 12. She's 11. Me and my wife sat down and we discussed it. You know, we have a pretty good life. I I don't have you know too much debt. I I, I live pretty good. Um and the kids kind of want to possibly get into this and then you know what? I'm responsible for the people that work for me. My job as an owner is more nowadays about taking care of the people that are employed for young construction. And I can't just think of me anymore. They come in, they got to provide for their kids and their families. And when I say that our sales... How many employees do you have? 30 plus. 30 plus. It, it fluctuates because now that doesn't include, um, you know, we run six, seven roofing crews every day. We do six, sure. seven roofs a day, siding, you know, three, four a day. So there's, those people would bring it into the fifties and hundreds. But Someone asked yesterday about uh, vehicles and I see this very small minded uh, business owners who start a business and they want to sub out everything. They want to 1099 every sales rep. They have hard time to buy a vehicle, buy iPad and give it to someone. Yes. You have 30 plus employees your advice to someone who struggled to delegate and struggle with the assets to employees? There's different phases. If you're under certain numbers, um, you should be so anything under a million dollars or two million, three million. I think you probably are. Maybe you have one sales guy. You have to look at it logistically. Um, once yeah, you pass two, three million dollars, yeah, two, three people, two, three people. So once you pass $5 million, I think you start looking at what, what you would do for vehicles. Um, we personally went with 1500 Dodge Rams. Um, we logo them, we do a partial wrap so they don't look gaudy. Um, but our employees, you know, I, I did have, I, I've used 1099s. I, I've used, uh, I've used subs for sales. I, I'm not saying that I would never do that, but I prefer an employee that, that sells, if you're gonna sell for us, that you ha I have a vested interest in them and they have a vested interest in me. So we have 401k medical, match and retirement. Um, they get a truck. 
they get a phone. Um, that person, and, and if we were just throw some basic numbers out, let's say you were had a sale guy, he, he, he as a number, he would make $100,000 um, with me doing it that way versus another sales guy would make 150, but he doesn't have medical. He doesn't have a truck. He doesn't have a phone. He doesn't have a 401k. What's the $50,000 worth? I'm just throwing out numbers. Is the $50,000 worth more? And I find that for me, that guy with two kids, the 401k, the truck and that, it's a pretty good deal. Whatever the number is. We don't have anybody I don't think anymore that sells under a million. I don't, I don't think anybody. Well, let's do a few more questions. Uh, Chris Cohen asks, do you have, do your sales guys pay in overhead? We, uh, and it's interesting. Yeah. We do have an overhead. Um, that's provided with, with, uh, you not knocking a door, you know, really. Um, have I hired people that are percentages? Sure. I've tried everything. I, I think that, you know, but, but yes, we, we, uh, we take overhead out and, and it's not 10%. It's higher than that. It's just the way it is. If you don't want to sell for us, that's okay. Got it. Angel P is asking, um, I'm starting a new business. If you had 5,000 to start, what would you do to get the best bang for your buck? Would you start a business with the $5,000 today? I started 100 <laughs> bucks. Some flyers and groceries. It's way more than I had. So You know, it's interesting because I think that question would go back to referrals. It was what referrals is now. We One of the biggest forms of marketing will always be referrals, by the way. Just if anybody's missing the boat, you already did Bob's house or Kim's house. If you're not reaching out to her friends and neighbors, um, we do a lot of doctor's houses up at Mercy Hospital where we live. I do most of their roofs. It, it's a referral system. They know who we are by branding, but they also know that we did their, their cousins, their relatives. They work next to each other. Reach whosoever jobs you're, you got five grand, whosoever jobs you're doing now, I guarantee they know somebody that needs something. And if you're starting out with 5,000, the reason we started our company, Young Construction, I did everything. I used to do everything. Mm -hmm. and, and I did that because I was broke. And you got to do what you got to do to put food on the table and provide for your family. I, I would add to it. This is the best time in business. I, I love that, that, that drive. The first year, you can do so much more. You can put, give so much attention to those clients so if I have $5,000, and this is just me, first three goes to my vehicle rep, and I'll explain why. You you rep your vehicle, and then I wouldn't even hire a company to do my website. I would do it myself. But I would go and I would take pictures of every roof that I do with the, my vehicle next to it. So you come to my website on every page. You see, I would look like a franchise roofer, like with the $5,000. You build a website because now here's what you, you know how much damage you can do with a vehicle wrap? It's not about vehicle wrap. It's about image. Now, Facebook post, YouTube video, website image, people start seeing you. And now, like Dan said, you go for referrals. You do someone, like I remember first year in business, people were asking me, is it a franchise? I remember homeowner telling me, Dmitry, I did not want to, I asked him, why did you go with us? And he said, Dmitry, I did not want to hire a big company. I want to, so I'm like, big company. I have two employees. I have Jesus doing my repairs and I have Aaron in the office answering phone calls. But for him, I was big company because I have a, a wrapped vehicle. So that's $5,000, three wrap website, basic, basic stuff. And then you just hustle. You do one job. You can, I, I bet you can get one job out of every build that you do. Well, and, and let's be realistic. <laughs> when, when I started, when I say I put up the flyers, I went to uh, every local lumber company there was. I joined the chamber. I think it was the city chamber was a couple hundred bucks. I would go to the lumber companies and say, if anybody needs a door, a window, you have to be willing in the very beginning to start, if you're just going to do roofs, I think that's limiting yourself. Um, mm -hmm. When you were talking about branding companies, I never forgot that because there was a point maybe 10 years ago, I considered, I, and I, I considered it back and forth for a few years. Do I call it young roofing? Well, no, because by then I had built such a heavy brand that they know we do roofing, young construction. Now we don't do anything inside hardly at all anymore. 
most of our work is. Siding was, I, I thought about giving up siding quite a few years ago. And it was my wife that actually said, no, let's just fix the problem. We have to do roofing and siding that are profitable. We need to figure out what's wrong and how to fix the siding in the windows so it's the same profitability as the roofing. Did he fix it? Yes, 100%. Increase the prices? You know, interesting. It was more, look, we had to, I had to take a step back and say, what's wrong here? And it, and, and it went to how the jobs are being bid. A roofer goes to bid a, a roofing job. It's quick. Once he gets good at it, he's in and out. We had to slow down the sales process. He needs to take more time or she measuring and being diligent on what the material is going to be because that'll kill you. You need to find out if you're going to wrap windows. All this stuff has to be documented differently than a roof. And then once you do that, you need to find yourself um, people that install siding like you do roofing. The same quality has to be there because you're going to go back if it's not and they're not going to be happy. And, and it takes a while to implement those processes. And once you get those systems in place, and I keep talking about systems, but I think it's the biggest thing in any company. When you see something that's broken, pull yourself back for a second and, 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 and objectively look at why. What, what happened during this job that caused it to go over budget? Because if you're running every job and it's on budget, you're doing better than I am. You know, when people say, you know, I've, I've done little jobs and made more profit than a big job. It's just... Sometimes that's the way it is, and and you find out why and try to fix that problem. Got it. Let's uh, do another question. Maurice says, um, we're just getting started with the roof storm restoration. What's the best source to learn what to look for once you get on the roof when looking for storm damage? Missing uh, shingles. <laughs> missing shingles? No, I, you know, it depends on where you're at and and, and, and this is a demographic one too. Me and you both know there's, you know, in, in the Midwest here, hail's your friend. I mean, really, it's going to be. Up north, Pittsburgh, yeah. Pennsylvania, it's probably more wind. Wind. Um, wind is in, interesting because, you know, at, at least in this area, you need to realize that wind damage with an unmatched shingle is the same as a whole roof damaged by hail. Mm -hmm. I mean, and Iowa and Minnesota is a little different. We're opening up a new location in Albert Lee, Minnesota. This is a, I buy buildings, I, I lease them to Young Construction, and then I use Young Construction to pay. M M McDonald's business model. I, I do, you know, I, and, and, it, and I keep two separate um, identities for that. You know, Young Construction. How many LLCs do you have? How many business heads? No, not a have? ton, probably four, five. Four or five hats? Four or five hats. I do the real estate separate. Um, when I got into construction, you know, in 07, I remember when the economy crashed, we, we used the construction company because there was people went from in retail people. And that was really a bonus. People went from uh, buying a new house to rehabbing. So for us being in retail, it was a, a win-win. We, we actually got bigger in 07. And then, so I carried that model over, I believe. And that's a little bit different if we're talking about companies and you're talking about storm restoration, there's how many companies do you, you know, that that do storm that don't own anything no here's what, what i want to answer to maurice and any retail guy out there who's trying to get in the storm restoration um i see a lot of guys who are killing storm restoration game and i see a lot of nice guys who don't last at all and here's i think the main difference you need to understand the business model is uh, completely different on highest level possible on your character and one trait of your character, are you a con confrontational person? Because if you're a nice guy, hearing no as an answer from from adjuster, from the homeowner, will devastate you. Not many people can. You know, like if if you're a nice guy and you cannot pursue someone, if you cannot make a phone uh, cold call, if you cannot door knock, if you cannot argue with someone else, like whether it's in court or whether it's during negotiation, you're not the right man for the job, unfortunately. And so many guys, they started and adjusters run circles around them. And if you see and study typical storm chasers, how they do it, they have the same objections. They have, But they're, I don't want to say confrontational, but that's probably the best word, though. They're okay 
to hear the denial and going after it, arguing that the roof should be bought. You're going to see and hear a lot of denials and a lot of stupid arguments by adjusters. And if you don't have a spine to stand up for yourself, stand up for If you're not a fighter, you're going to lose this game. And if you consider yourself to be a nice guy, don't get an insurance restoration. It'll mess with your soul, with your character. And those guys usually don't get far because they cannot live with themselves. They feel like they're doing something wrong because they're not confrontational people. They, they, they don't like being argument in a business and insurance is it, it you're like a journey you're always coming after someone unfortunately i you know i'm a balance um, i'm not gonna i would never sit here you know we're probably 70 percent insurance sure we do um with with catching a storm and i like that word catching because i have in-house supplementing in-house marketing i i have turned my company over to in-house because i believe nobody cares more about you Hundred percent. Than than the people that are surrounding you, and you. I don't like the even word hire. I love to recruit. If I go to a place and the guy sells me a nice pair of shoes, and he's a really good salesperson, I'm I'm talking to him. I'm I'm saying, hey, have you ever thought about selling roofs? It's it's a different mentality, and we just did. I do this all the time. I I talk to um, my sales manager. I said I want to do a. I want to call all the customers that we put roofs on and, and see if they got enough insulation. You know, uh, $300,000 later in sales, probably, you know, I don't know what the number was, but just by having all the sales guys sit at a table, there, it's not optional on that stuff either. There is times you have to be a leader, but you have to also tell them that this is what you're doing today. Um, it's part of being in, uh, um, part of the team. We're going to call your customers and we're going to, and it's interesting. Because if you want to know if you did a good job with your customer, call them back six months later and ask them to buy something else. You'll find out real quick, right? Absolutely. I agree. And, and many don't. And I remember we had a company here. You mentioned earlier companies who do millions and millions go out of business. We have one here, 2013, 14, 15. We're doing, so they went 1 million, 5, 25, then 15, 5, and out of business. And we were doing a lot of business after them with the future storms. And people were giving me that feedback. They're like, oh, who did you roof last time? That company. And I knew that they were doing like 25 and moved to another market. And now I'm doing the business because they would never hire them again. And the company is nowhere to be found. So we have four locations, um, Mason City, Waverly, Iowa. And then uh, when Duracial hit, we were already in Cedar Rapids. So Duracial came through. I don't know if you were in that area, but it was just crazy and everybody came everybody came we were already there but i ended up purchasing another building there through another llc and i lease it to me it's a uh, partially leased anyway this is the third year second year second or third year i say four years five years i'll get the calls that's why i'm leaving a the location there hmm. i know what's going to happen in four or five years all the people that aren't going back and this this is local people too. This doesn't mean this is retail companies. Um, it's been proven to me in Mason city when I was, uh, once the storm's over four or five years, the inferior work will come to play and then we'll get the phone calls. You'll always have, you always have business. Love it. Uh, great question from Isaac. Any tips for taking over father's roofing business will start by selling repairs and door hangers. You have two kids, you're planning, three kids, but you're planning uh, to pass it to your kids. What's your take on this? Would you, I would say taking over father's business, what's going to happen to the father? I, he's going to work with you or not? Like I recently did a couple of video tours, like Trust Roofing was one of them. Son took over the business, absolutely crushing it. The best family business story I've seen. Uh, but then I also have Tom Williams from Houston he worked with his dad in Chicago. They couldn't they couldn't work together. And dad his his ways. Tom wanted his ways. He went to Houston, built a company and doing millions of dollars in sales. It's really up to up to your character. I don't know what's uh I mean, I would take over father's roofing business if there's a book of business, if there is some kind of assets, good name, good reputation, something. 
you know, if he's just a sub for someone or if he has three Google reviews, you might go on your own and start from scratch. I found a lot of people starting from scratch with a branding and they just explode. And some people take outdated logo and outdated name with someone's initials. I mean, there, it doesn't have value. I mean, yeah, you know, both directions. I mean, did you grow up working with your father and that's the business? And are you doing, you know, five roofs a week? It depends on where the business is. If it's a hundred, if it's a, if it's a multi-million dollar business, um, if my kids get into our business, which is pretty big today for us, and they're starting out, my kids already come to the office at 14. My son, one son during the summer works at the front answering the phones. My other son is going out with, uh, the lead of my roofing crew. So you're well, not, you're not coming into the, the business. No. Uh, uh. And, and, and I, I do that because I love them enough to know that they're going to have to work. And, and here's the thing with anybody in your business. This is a hard one. And this is the one that I see a lot. Um, it happened to me. You got to be willing to let, let, let people go that you love and that you care about for the, and the reason you got to be willing to do that is for the other people, not for me, not just for my company, but for the other people. Because if that person is pulling the company down, in effect, they're affecting the other families that are in your company. You have to make decisions. And even if some of those people are at the top and it's happened, I, I mean, you know, we all hear this story. It happened to me um, where somebody quits and they started a roofing company in my own city. And everybody says, well, you met. Well, yeah, of course you're pissed off at first. You know, it's, why wouldn't you be, especially you, you, you change if, your competition. It, and, and well, I don't even mind that as much as it, the, if they would have come and sat down with you and talked to you, it's when they take proprietary information and stuff, but here's the deal. I don't think about that. I think about what direction I'm going because in the long run, I could sit there and dwell on it. Now, do I pay attention to my competition? Yeah. You eat them for breakfast. I, but, but, but I pay attention to where we're going as a company. I want to be the leader of, of what we do, where, you know, the best of things I ever get from conferences was other people. I have better ideas than I did mm -hmm. and, and then take it and implement it and put it into your company. You know, would you agree that two days at the conference equals six months in college? I, I, I think that if you go to any conference now, here's the key, who are you bringing into the conference? Who's coming and what is the purpose? I used to go to the conference and try to absorb so much. And now I go for networking and I go for nuggets and I call it 10. I like 10. So I take five long-term nuggets that I'll write down from different speakers, people like you, different things. And then I take five mini nuggets. I like the ones that can be an instant return on value. Love it. Whether it's an emotional value or a financial value. Um, sometimes it's just a simple little thing on the way here. I driving in the snow. This is pretty messy but i was thinking about the tarps you know or the synthetic felt that we get for we buy it by the container shipping container and i got to order it every year i just ordered this year it's worth and as i'm doing it i'm thinking you know what i don't have tarps that have my logo and if i want tarps that have my logo i want them to be bright orange so when i leave here i'm going to call my marketing department i'm going to talk to them and i'm going to say hey find me orange tarps with my logo and i'm going to buy a bit of them. why don't i have tarps why don't i have orange tarps when they're using them to surround the house to protect the shrubbery i should mm -hmm. i should have orange tarps love it guys um i cannot speak enough on the conferences this is uh winter uh season for learning for studying my life has changed when i started coming in guys like dan are at every conference. Here's what I see. People who are always hungry to learn, not to party. I mean, party takes place. Networking takes place. But you have to get out. You have to learn. And I want to invite you to Roofing Process Conference in Orlando. We put the best of the best speakers, like in my opinion, people who deserve to be on the stage. You have to vet people who you're listening um, to because not everybody... I mean, I, I see also business owners on the stage and next year go out of business there. You know, you have to be careful. I don't go to money grab conferences, but at our conference, you know, it's the fourth year I'm doing it. I, I lost money at every single one of them. Every single year? I, every single year. And I, I lost $150,000 just to switching from switching from Las Vegas to Orlando. And I did it 
you know, for the fans, for people, because they couldn't come. But the thing about like last year, we I, I don't even promote my school. I have zero sales last year. I didn't even ask anyone to buy anything from me. And if you cannot learn from people like Adam Bansman, Eric Green, I mean, the list goes on. I mean, this year, Dustin Bigler, you know, Apple Roofing Guys, Logan. I mean, we are putting people in front of you who I personally vetted. And, you know, if you don't learn from them, I don't know if you can learn. It was Dustin Bigler that I was at a dinner with, uh, with a friend and he was there. He's the one when you did the branding videos and he's the one where I got the orange felt from. So it wasn't my idea. Admit, you know, where you, where you see something that's successful and do it. Uh, it was, uh, the orange felt. So speaking of that, I could get the felt with my logo on it. The hard part was getting impregnated orange into the felt. So, but this year, now that that happened with the Vegas thing, I, th I think I can come to your conference. So I'm kind yes. of excited. Uh, I, I go to, you, you, you will never be the same. I, 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 here's my thing. There's conferences I went to that I no longer go to, and I will never um, say anything bad because some of my best friends I met at those made conferences, connections. I made connections, but I'm no longer a fit for that conference due to we're going a different direction. Um, you talked about it and you touch about it. Um, at any time that you're running your company, you can decide to go a different direction. If you feel that it's not the right way, if you feel that what your direction you're going as a person, even as a human being, you know, um, you can change that direction. You know, I, I think this year I'll have 21 years sobriety and you had Paul Reed on here. And, Love it. Um, you know, roofers in recovery is a great thing. Uh, I think any program that helps people get out of the despair of addiction is a great thing. I wouldn't have anything had I not quit. Now I openly tell anybody that I don't care who knows, you know, 20, 21 years ago, my life wasn't so good or 20, 20, 20 years this year. So in November and everything I have today is because I made choices. It's the same thing that you did with your fitness. One day you were, you were going this direction. And, and the next day you said, you know what? I don't want to do that no more. And, and you made a change. Now I see you swimming in swimming pools in, <laughs> in the middle of Minnesota. Listen, uh, I want to add this. I don't know how it works, but for me personally, every time I go to the conference, and I'm not talking about even the roofing. I mean, we go to YouTube conference, Facebook marketing. It, usually within one hour of me attending event, I can justify, you know, all the expenses with that conference. Like I come in, like it, it's one person is, because you're hungry. If you're focused and you're looking for uh information you will find it like usually you know you will run into a guy like dan and you'll ask him question you'll get your answer and it will justify it you'll make instant money the whole thing the whole thing i ran into a guy from texas at a conference just last month and and he's on his own now and i was really happy i was really happy he made that turn and 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 the breakout sessions you know look some of the best breakout sessions, I, 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 somebody would say something in the room and I'd go, man, I've been doing that wrong for a long time. I probably shouldn't do that no more. You know, and those are the things. But my favorite thing now is this, um, meeting you or meeting somebody in the industry that's passionate about what they do. We don't always agree. Mm -hmm. I think uh, you, you touched on it, um, storm work, retail versus storm work. I don't think there's a division. I think it it should be both. I think that why wouldn't you want to build a brand? And maybe that's that's their choice. I personally, I I I would rather build a brand to where when I come to an area within two years, I go to areas and within two years, you know, they're like, well, we didn't want to hire a storm chaser, I'm a storm catcher. Is that different? I don't know. Love it. Let's do uh, let's do a few more questions, comments. I love St uh, Steven Schneider uh, comment. Posting pictures of roofs constantly is only flexing to other roofers. Do you do you see a lot of activity, or just me roofers for roofers? I see so many things like roofers. Instead of trying to reach the homeowner or do content for homeowner, everybody's like, you know, when I started doing content, my YouTube channel for storm group roofing, it, it was. Who makes the best siding? Who makes the best shingle? I did not care what the roofers would think about it. I went on my own. I did my research. I didn't care who I'm going to offend with it. It's like, what's good for my customer? You know, yeah. or stuff like Flex Seal, you know, 
Like, how is it good for the customer? People stop losing uh, using Flex Seal. That's a homeowner's video. And roofers hate on me all the time because I don't care for them. Like, <laughs> when are you posting your content? So it's, it's the same thing with radio marketing we were talking about. Um, if you have a, if you're working in an area that got hit by a storm and you're doing Facebook and social media and geo-targeting is huge, I, I might add, because geo-targeting for those that don't know is I can target an area, say an association or a neighborhood demographically, and I can put my ads on that pop up on your phone. Um, I'm sure you've seen it. If you went to a grocery store or something, sometimes you'll see something pop up and, and that's what that is about. And if I'm in an area, why wouldn't you utilize geo-targeting for that area? And of course you're going to pour, we call a finished Friday. We do every Friday. We do a finished Friday all year long. And, uh, we show a picture of a homeowner possibly holding up I heart young construction or, or, or a picture. Uh, this year we just did one with a, a house wrapped with a bow brand new siding and roof. Um, timing's everything. The same thing when you know that people are driving home at noon or having lunch, why wouldn't you try to target your marketing at that time? Absolutely. Uh, growth evangelist asking, what's your usual accepted conversion for a roofing sales guy, retail and commercial? What's your closing rate? It's different. And, and I say this because it depends on what kind of lead we give them. Um, if you call our office and, and, and you go out to their house, I think the closing rate is, is less than if I, if we bring you into our showroom at young construction, in my opinion, your closing rate should be almost 90%. Hmm. I, I, maybe I'm a high number, but I think it should be high because very few people in my area are bringing you into a showroom. What if it's a home advisor lead? I don't do home advisor. <laughs> Why not? Same reason you do the videos on them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I want you to answer to this. Do you agree? Or the, the, and because I have a strong comment on it, but I'll let you start. Nate Schwippy says, bingo, revenue is just a piece in contest. Do you agree that revenue is just a piece in contest? I have some really good friends that have some very high revenue in this industry that I, I love with all my heart. I go on trips with them to, you know, I go to the, football, baseball. I spend some time with some guys that have some pretty big companies and there. We've become close friends. So revenue is in a, to me is a number. Um, who you are as a person is going to show pretty quickly in this mm -hmm. industry. Um, but when I have a problem, if I have an issue, I'll probably reach out to the guy that's running a pretty big revenue and say, Hey, have you ever had this happen? What do you do in this situation? Any suggestions? Um, you got to be willing to know that. And, and then I think that's in our industry. You know, you got to let go. If you're having a problem, call somebody before you file bankruptcy. You know, uh, you, we were talking about that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think uh, being teachable, and I talk about this a lot. I didn't even bring it up here. But the biggest problem I see is, is people that are successful and, 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 and are unteachable. I see people sometimes in our industry and I used to happen to me. So I, I'm at, at fault where I got to be willing to go to a conference and keep an open mind. If, if every day I'm a teacher, then I'm not learning. I, I got to be able to, you know, and it doesn't matter what revenue you are. You know, I can, I, a guy running a million dollar company and it will remind me of something I used to do. And I'll go, that's, that's good customer service. Uh, my answer to Nate is this. I see, I see a little tension between guys who are doing high volume and guys who do little volume but never have done high volume. So there's, there's guys in the middle, guys like Eric Rina, who have a capacity to build a $20 million company but choose to stay five, six, you know, by choice. But there are also a lot of guys who never have done past two or three but hate, I don't want to say hating, but don't understand people who do 10. Definitely... There is a place for peace and contest uh, among those who just only all I hate it too when they only talk about money, like top revenue, sales, sales, you know, belittling other little guys like, oh, who are you? I'm doing 50 million, you're doing three. That, that's not acceptable. But also, I think a lot of smaller guys have to learn how to get their numbers up. I think smaller guys are having every excuse in the book 
why they're better than bigger companies, why they're not growing. And you're not better. Like, listen, if you don't have, if you've never tried to go after five, 10 million, if you never have a big team, don't hate on big teams because there's a lot of guys who are so small and they're like, oh, we're better than that company because our quality is better. No, no, you're not. You're making the same mistakes and think about what's better for the customer. $10 million company will more likely eat two, three jobs that they're going to mess up. You know, two million dollar company will file bankruptcy over three jobs that went wrong. It it can happen. So I I think that young guys have to learn from you know what are those companies are doing to do ten million dollars, because if you have a capacity, if you can figure out how to do ten million, you can actually go back and fine tune your numbers and increase the revenue. You can become more efficient once you know how to make high revenue. But if you've never done, let's say, two, more than $2 million, you just don't know how to sell the jobs. Well, and, and let's talk about that real quick because there's this thing I believe called debt to ratio. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by debt to ratio is that if I'm going to run a $5 million company, I'm going to have to have a certain amount of credit, mm -hmm. a certain amount of uh, money to run that. And, and, and the same thing goes for a $10 million company. Those two numbers are entirely different. Completely. I'm a big believer in paying off debt. Um, maybe not Dave Ramsey, you know, but, but every year we pick out which vehicles we're going to pay off, what loans we're going to pay off. We run a tight, tight ship financially. I do my best because what you have today, if you're running, let's say you're running 30 million what you have at 30 million in debt if you're running a retail company or that catches storms and you don't take care of that while things are good then if things go down which no matter what you think they will it, it, it can happen and 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 i think that's the misconception sometimes i i think people don't don't realize that while things are good you know maybe instead of of uh of buying the corvette or the maserati mm -hmm. um now now, is there a time for, you know, getting yourself something? Nice? Sure. Why not? But take care of the people. It's my responsibility to provide a company that's going to be there for the people that, that, that work for us. And if, 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 if I'm not paying my bills and taking care of my debt as best as I can, and, it, and, and it's more than just getting paid last, um, you should sit down at least twice a year. I do at least two times a year and, and sometimes four times a year and see what does it cost to open your door every year. So every, every, every six months, how much does it cost to put the key in and turn it? I don't mean what it costs for your sales and all that. I mean, what it costs over, what is your overhead? What is your, does it cost you $50,000 a month to open the door? And that'll give you a basis on what revenue you need to generate in a retail or storm company. Because if you're not knowing those numbers, very, very hard to run a company. I agree. Let's do a few more questions. Uh, Growth Evangelist, very active today. I appreciate all your questions. Uh, what do you guys think of the switch to video sales with drone or else? I have you seen a huge difference compared to the both uh, to on the spot estimate. There's more and more companies are doing it. And now if you can figure out how to do it remotely these days, I mean, there was, you know, you have tools like Summa Quote and you have, you know, like you can, you can sell a room via Zoom. I've been doing it remotely for 20 years. That's the beauty of that. It, so they have a machine or they have a drone now. You fly over roof. I used to do it with a tape measure and give you your bid right now. It's been around forever. It was around before they had to the drone. You know, it, it, here's, here's my thing with that. I believe in technology and I hire people that are smarter than me, way smarter. That's the key. You know, um, yeah, I, I think I did look at, uh, I think, Nothing against job numbers. Sure. I think AccuLinks has a new thing that's integrated with their, with their system with the drone. Um, we use drones. I, I have both of my marketing girl and uh, and my uh, videographer are both uh, getting their licenses. We're I'm a big fan of making sure that if you're going to fly the drone, you're legal. Um, some areas now you have issues. Oh yeah, even flying it. Drones are getting harder and harder. They, they are. They're really cracking down on. 
employees are the way to go, Stephen, Stephen says. Nate, if you ask someone what's their revenues without also asking what their margins are, you're doing a disservice to this industry. I don't agree with that. And here, here's why. There's private information, there's public information. Um, I agree that net profit is way more uh, important than other, but it's every, it's a personal business decision. What do you do with the money? It's the same thing with Texas. The reason, I mean, our text code is written for business owners. I mean, you can go um, on, like as an employee, you can go on vacation and as a business owner, you go on a company tour, right? And in one case, it's write off. In another one, you, you pay taxes on that amount. So just to say, like, for example, I can live half a million dollar lifestyle and pay very little taxes, not yeah. because I'm a crook, but because I'm smart. Uh, I, I like Donald Trump about it, right? So yeah. like, because, you know, it's stupid to pay taxes. It's stupid to show a lot of profit because we can and that's why I don't agree. That's why it's very misleading. People, uh, you know, I always uh, hear it, you know, sh show us tax returns. What does it have to do with anything? Well, and here, here's the thing. This is, this is a bigger thing than people think. There's, there's two numbers. You got your, your number that you get prior to overhead, tr prior to debt. Exactly. And then you got your number that you get now on. You should know that um, our sales guys have a certain number they got to hit. And, overhead this is so baffling to me everybody's 10 20 what 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 is that your your overhead is based upon what your debt ratio is mm -hmm. and if you're not adjusting it and looking at it every what we just talked about at least multiple times a year that changes that's why i try to keep my debt low you know so so when i'm hiring people if i keep my debt to a certain point my percentages are less for overhead I'm not basing my overhead on some imaginary number, 10% that somebody made up. I'm basing it on factual numbers. What does it cost you on construction to open the door? Because the people that I, I employ, the people that come to work for me, my job is to them and my job's to the company to keep the debt down as much as I can. So, so the overhead's down. So therefore I'm able to hire more people. I'm able to take less out of a, out of overhead. It's, mm -hmm. I've never believed in 10%. There's no such thing. Most people's what? 17? Easy. I mean, I, I, the average numbers should be, and here's how industry breaks down. On the low end, you will have, on the very low end, you'll have 20% gross profit margin. On the highest level, you'll be 50%, right? But the average is 30, 40%. That's what everybody's charging. That's average. Yeah, 30, 40% gross. Now, from there, you'll go anywhere from 5% to 15% net. Now, when uh, what I don't agree with Nate here, so Nate, you have problems with you know bigger companies. You know, in your opinion, is disservice to the industry. So you're probably referring. You have strong opinion on 17 million dollar company from uh, <clears throat> Pennsylvania, which you did. And I've seen their books. I've seen their numbers. I've seen. I mean, they have two million dollars in receivables. Here's what you are missing: when you're doing 10 million dollars versus two million dollars, you have way more leverage. You have, uh, you know, the credit lines, the options, the rebates, the write-offs. You know, people are buying buildings. Like, for example, if I buy a building, if I buy a few more vehicles, like, yes, maybe my net profit is the same as $2 million, but I have way more leverage, way more options, way more tools in my pocket. Like, I can do way more. Even though on paper it's the same as $2 million, but, you know, you're renting and I'm owning my building. But on paper, you know, we're as profitable, but on the long term, I'm winning 10 times uh, over you because, you know, I have more, more money to play around. Well, and it's the same thing with sales. I, I mean, if we're being real honest, there's a huge difference between a guy that goes and gets a lead on his own. We mm -hmm. pay actually a little bit more on that, by the way, than a guy that gets fed 10 leads Listen. a day. If you're making, why would you give anyone ten leads a day? Well, <laughs> I'm, it, 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 if there's a storm, sometimes sure. you got to buckle up and do what you got to do. That's when we hire. But uh, you know, we have people. I have guys that can that can do very well with a you know a large amount of leads, and their closing ratios are good. I it 
I spend less time just hiring a bunch of people for sales because our system's a little different. I'm not looking for, I don't want to say that wrong. I'm not looking for, a, for an entire storm chaser. I'm looking for somebody that wants to come into a company and stay. be part of our system who will stay. I prefer somebody that has a tie to the, to the company that, that, that I know that they, they have kids. Maybe they, they have a life they want to provide for, for their future. I want to help them with that, with, with retirement, with everything. I don't want just, you know, and, and to each their own, there's some very successful companies that have just people that, that are not employees. That's great. But for us as a company, I try very hard. Now, will I hire outside? Of, yes. If there's a big storm, I'm going to do what I got to do. But generally speaking, I'd rather have you be part of our family, part of our system, not just words, but where, where you say, Hey, yeah, I, I, I've done a matching 401k for five years with young construction. I have, I'm going to try to build a, a system. And let's do this question. Elias uh, Barentos asking, what's your biggest advice for a 20 year old one year into the business being partners with their father? Jeez. <laughs> it's, it's hard. I never had that. So for me, it was different. I, I started mine out um, on my own. I, I don't really know. You know, I guess it depends on the relationship you have with your father and your family. I'm, I've I, been, I had a business years ago that was smaller and I had a partner. I, I do know that I'm, me and my wife are partners. I'm, I'm still 1% more. <laughs> Here, here's the nice thing. Play. Here's the thing. I, I think in any business, I have some, I have a partner in some real estate stuff. Um, sometimes I do. You have to be on the same page. Um, I've been, he's been my partner for 15, 17 years. We, we don't even hardly talk uh, uh, on a regular basis. We just, as long as I do my job and he does what he does, uh, we don't have issues. I, I think if you're going to start a business with your family or with anybody, you know, I see a lot of that. Um, the guy from Texas that I was talking about, he had a big, his, there was three of them and he started his own. They all had a falling out. I don't know. I don't know a good answer. I, I think it depends on the relationship. I agree. Uh, I would go on my own if it's toxic. And if you're yes. down to earth with your dad, um, I, I think figure on how much to pay, like fair pay for both people. Because, you know, business owners eat last, like leaders eat last. And when you have two uh, people in a business, it's hard because nobody gets paid if you didn't make any money. And as long as there are no blaming games, like why... Because it sucks. Like, you know, if I work with my dad and we lost money for two weeks or whatever, we have to pay. I mean, it's, it's stressful, but you'll figure it out. But it really depends on the relationship. Charlie Anderson, can you talk about the different ceilings you hit over the years and how you coped with breaking through those different ceilings? Like I what? remember the first year I had a million dollars. <laughs> that was when a million was a lot of money. <laughs> I guess it's still, it still is, but I remember selling a million in sales thinking, God, I've made it. I'm something else. And I, it's an ego sets in, right? Million dollars is not. And now you're doing 30 and you don't think, well, and, and you're like, more. oh, there's guys who are doing. I don't, you know, it, it's the same thing about the number. If you noticed, I avoid the numbers a little bit, yep. maybe, maybe a little bit because I, I'm not quite where. What are you going to do this year? I'm going to ask you again. I'm, this year will will only be you know will be close to fifteen. Fifteen. Yeah. So you scale, but it, it's a great size. It 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 and and I'm very proud of our people. You know that's the key. I I just the reason I shy so much is I've been doing I've been in this industry a long enough time, and and I just keep seeing it over and over again. You know where where it's the number, and I don't care if you make a hundred million dollars a year. I think you need to know um, as a person who you are and what you want to be. One of my good friends, really good friends from Colorado, Scott Rapoli, and, 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 and I talked to him once in a while. And, Interesting. And, and, and I really learned a lot from him on, on you got to be able to know when to scale up and when to scale down. Um, they haven't had a hailstorm in Colorado for what, seven, mm -hmm. five years? So, I was talking to him. I says, how's that? How did that affect Colorado? And he says, a lot of companies went out of business. Interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, so if your whole theory is storm restoration or they travel, 
Um, but I don't think it mattered to any of the companies that went out of business what number they made the year before. Uh, I, I I want you to uh, to go on a rant uh, that you went with me yesterday. You said that you don't believe that the roofing is uh, recession proof. Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> so there are a lot of people that are going to agree or disagree with me. So I'm I'll take the beating. I've never believed that the roofing industry is 100% recession proof because they say you can go knock a door if and, and insurance will always pay. That's the theory behind it. Or, or retail. Retail could be affected if the uh, interest rates keep going up, which they, they're crazy right now, and if it crashed. Mm -hmm. But here's, here's my thing. I believe that most people are going to do one thing. They're going to take care of their family, the people they love. So if... If you go back to 07 when the economy did bad, or, or you go back to when that happens, and let's say a hailstorm comes through your area, it's my belief that, you know, they usually get that first check. And if you can't pay your mortgage, I'm just saying, I don't know. I don't know if I would, if my roof got hail damage, minor hail damage, or I might. You're going to do what's right for you, um, and, and, not and for some roof. It's part of the reason the insurance um, mortgage companies started requiring the check to go to the the mortgage company because people were actually in 07 they were taking the check and then the house went into foreclosure and they found out that hey he had an insurance claim they kept the money and that was part of the reason they made that switch by the way that's why that really? that's why the insurance check sometimes now goes to the mortgage companies which created the problem in the first place if we're really going to be honest mm -hmm. they were the ones that gave the loans out that they probably shouldn't have which mm -hmm. created the whole situation but we could spend days on the insurance, couldn't we? Who's the the worst insurance today? Carrier. Demographically, um, that's a question that that I believe would be demographically. I don't know. I so in our company, we do in house supplementing. Um, I have two people that can do it. Um, would I sub it out? I keep saying um today. Would I sub it out? Yes, if I had to. So far, we haven't had to. Uh, supplementing it for those that might not know is basically when you take an insurance claim and anything that was left off and not in there, you put it back in. And I, I guess, what was the question again? One more time. Um, the worst insurance company. I try to build relationships with the companies that are in my areas. Um, he answers like a politician. Uh, okay. You don't yeah. have to answer it. But I don't, is it a state farm? You know, what's funny. They've been good to me. I think sometimes, if we're going to really be honest about it, I think sometimes the mutuals seem to be more problematic. I've had more problems with mutuals where, where a smaller company feels like that they somehow are, it's their money. Hmm. I think any insurance company that thinks that the insured money belongs to the insurance company <laughs> is crazy. It's a claim. Wow. If your house is damaged by a storm, the insurance yeah. company's only job is to make it right. And any insurance company that does not want to financially take care of the homeowner, you know, make the change. If you're insured by somebody in your area and it happens to be whoever it is, multiple times you come across them, I mean, be realistic and let the homeowner know, hey, this is going to, there's companies that we don't even want to deal with. We will turn it in. That's when we turn it into a regular bed because we've dealt with the insurance company. It's just not worth it. And so we'll give them a retail bid and say, this is it. You deal with your insurance company because they, they're that that out of control. Love it. David Summerlee, really liked your comment. I'm no longer a fit for that conference. I, and sometimes, guys, here's my take on it. Like you guys are part of groups. Uh, yesterday, I have a guy who've been my friend on the Facebook and off Facebook for the last four or five years. I have to block him. I have to move on. You have to remove toxic people and any bad influence from your life, period. Even if it's your relative. I recently cut out two family members. Like I told him, you, you, you cannot come to my house. You cannot play with my kids. Like you got to do what you got to do because if you're not going to take care of yourself, you're emotional, you're like you are, you know, is average of five people around your life, but also the conferences that you go to, the groups, the, the, the fights, the, you know, it affects you more than you know. And um, 
if you feel like you're you're not aligned, I just heard it so many times when vendors are telling me like, oh, we don't agree, but we go. Oh, we don't agree, but we like, first of all, you're spending money with someone. You're doing business with someone. I, I actually kind of like cancel culture to the point, to the point. I don't agree with everything that's happening with the kind and stuff, but to the point, if you're not supporting a brand, if you're not supporting the person, stop doing business. I'm not saying like, openly hate the person but at least stop supporting the behavior because there's some like with the youtube and youtubers like there's some like for example you know mma there's a few guys you from youtube comes to mma i mean they're nasty very bad behavior like you know i don't agree with dan balzerian right i don't agree with lifestyle i will never buy anything from him for that reason and if it, I like what Dan says. I'm no longer a fit. He's very positive about it, but he he is not fit. He doesn't want to be associated, and I think it's the smartest decision. It you touched on it too. It shouldn't be just a company decision. It should be a based on a personal. Mm -hmm. um, 20, 20 years ago, when I got sober, I cut out everybody in my life. Almost mm -hmm. uh, there was very few people that wanted to be around a guy that didn't drink, and and I'll tell you why. Because everybody was a, I was around, that's all they did. Um, I think that if you're going to be a positive influence and, and change things, which you can do any day, you can wake up today and say, hey, you know, I'm done with this life. And, 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 and that should apply to your business and, to, and, and, and realizing it, catching it, and realizing that maybe that's not who I want to be. I, there's conferences, and I won't say nothing bad about anybody, sure. um, that I made a decision because our company – I don't, I don't want to attend it. I'm not getting what I need as a person or as a business. And, and now that said, there's other conferences that have come up um, where I'm, I'm attending now. And, and it's because I've been to those conferences. and The gap will the, always be filled. The gap will be filled by what you want to fill it. You want to fill yourself up with positivity, then go there. If you want to fill yourself up with crap, then go to the other one. Love it. Um, I want to add just one note to it. Um, it goes on a very personal note I just, because I consult with a lot of people and I never made videos about it. But I have a guy other day texted me, um, you know, battling over child support, not support over uh, custody, you know, nasty girlfriend and stuff. A lot of times it's relationships. A lot of times it's I mean, if you're a woman and your husband is you know, punching you or like, ra like raising voice or whatever, get out. If you're a man and you, you live with nasty woman who may be drinking too much or just bad influence, it goes on every single level. I made a decision to cut out stress from my life like long time ago. And I cut out very nasty relatives. And it, it was very hard. The hardest decision I've ever done to lose a family member because they're stressed. You know, I realized in front of them, I'm always stressed. Like sometimes even suicidal stress because you're like, how can you do this to me? And you have to say no. You have to stand up for yourself, for your character, and think about the future of you. You have to take care of yourself because a lot of business problems, they come from family. You know, the reason I'm as successful as I am, because when I come home, my wife is there, my kids are there, and it, there's peace. I cannot imagine coming home to screaming, yelling, arguing, like I wouldn't be able to do this if I have fight in the morning over who's going to be picking up kids from school. <laughs> well, and there's, there's a huge difference on, you know, in a relationship anyway, on having, you know, disagreements versus, you know, the, the family thing. When I, when I did get sober, multiple family members um, were in addiction. And I remember, um, I remember that clearly because it was the hard part. The friends was, you know, not as easy. It was easier. But I knew that if I was going to make positive changes in my life and not, not pick up a drink and not use, uh, I was going to have to eliminate even family. And I did. Uh, I have a sister now that we're, we're, we're talking after a year ago. So it was probably 15 years. Well, wow. now I don't blame the family member, but just every time I was around them, it wasn't positive in any way. It wasn't a good thing. Now, this person, my sister, I love, I love her. That didn't mean I didn't love her. She straightened up her life.
It just took her a little longer. So now she's back in my life. But, but, but anybody that's in my life today, I, I try to control it. I was, uh, I make mistakes. I judge people. I, I, I called up a, uh, a guy in this industry and apologized to him. You know how hard it is for a man. You know how we are mm -hmm. to call another man and say, you know what? I'm sorry. I, I treated you wrong. And for no reason, I don't know why, but, but that's it. You know, even at this age that I am realizing that I make mistakes, I judge people and I judged him and I shouldn't have. Mm. And I called him up and, and, and he says, you know what? I would really like to talk about this sometime. He says, I really appreciate the fact that you called. Well, wow. that's it. But, but sometimes you got to put down that and, and, and the family is the kids you have at home. Right. Exactly. I see your video with your family. I pay more attention. We're talking about marketing. I see that more than I see anything else. You're cutting a hole in the ice and jumping in a pool in the winter in Minnesota. <laughs> I did it this morning. <laughs> That's how I feel amazing. Um, Steven Snyder says, I think an entire breakout session on heat and revenue lent marks ceiling would be gold. Do you want to do a session on that? About what? Uh, break-in session, hitting revenue, landmarks, ceiling would be gold. Yeah, I'd do that with you. I, I think, and, and I want to tell everybody today, you know, I appreciate you bringing me here, by the way, Dimitri. Sure. Uh, you made a lot of good changes. If no one's told you, um, I didn't always agree with every, everything you were doing. Sure. Until the last couple of years, I saw the change in you. And you started going a different direction. But one thing I've always respected about you you don't care what anybody else thinks. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, it. you know, here's the deal. Don't allow other people to give up your beliefs. Don't. If you believe what you believe, you do what you do. And, and, and that I have a lot of respect for that. In this industry that we're in, you know, if you can follow that, stand true to you and don't, don't alter that, you'll be pretty good. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, speaking of a conference, if you look at a, our lineup, w one of the things we did, we, we, so keynotes are 25 minutes because nobody can sit through 45 minutes. I just, I made a decision because I'm looking at a time, like if I'm honest with myself, what's the last time I've listened to 45 minute keynote? It never happens. I have to break down in three, even if it's good. Now, 25 minute keynotes, but people on the stage, you know, Dustin Bigler and Logan, I mean, they're doing like, they're worth 150 million now. Now, Alex and Zach, uh, lifetime builders, they, they did 30 million a year ago. They're probably 40, 50 million. So they are sharing keynote between those two. And a lot of people like that. Like I'm putting on the stage people at different sizes, people who have been in, at the game 10 years plus and people who've done it in the five, seven years because there's different flavors and there's different ways. And that's what I love about this industry. You know, like Sam Collard, first year in business, it's what you doing after yeah, 20. I've but, seen that. But, but it's awesome. It's awesome. It's more than one way to do it if you're smart, if you're educated. Um, Nate again says, Nate, I really want to run in circles around it. I'll bite. Everyone talks and brags about revenue without any talk of margins. And again, I think I, I think we have the same problem, not not a problem, the same trend with the billionaires. Look at Elon Musk. Look at you know the biggest. You know, how, Elon Musk worth two hundred fifty billion dollars. Doesn't mean that he has two hundred fifty billion dollars. It's, it's interesting because I know guys that do five million that have more than guys. Exactly. That have 30 million. Nate's got a point. Nate, yeah. you, you got a point about this. Here's here's what I would suggest to anybody in this industry, no matter what revenue, because I don't care if you make a hundred million. It doesn't matter. Sure. What if you're looking at what your life is? What do you what do you what do you want? You know, what's your what's your what's your comfort? Is it 15, 20 million? Is is, is 30 million gonna make you feel a certain way? Exactly. I don't know. I I think for me as a as a business owner, um and in a real estate, I, I, I invested into, um, where do I want to be? I kind of, I'm kind of there. I'm pretty happy today. I have everything you could ever want. I love it. I, I it's not about, um, when you reach a point in your business, in your life, where it's not necessarily about the money. And I'm not saying that I don't want to, because I'm very aggressive. Mm -hmm. I'm very, you know, competitive. But there's nothing 
today that I don't have or that I don't have. I'm the same. I, way. I'm just so so. My family, my life is probably the best it's been in many many years. But I had to do some stuff to get to where I'm at. Uh, do I? Would I buy a hundred million dollar yacht? No. But am I content where I am? I can go anywhere I want, do what I want. I love the great people that work with me. Uh, I, I do think sometimes in this industry, and I and I and maybe this is something for you sometime. We're so stuck on what we do for a living. And and there's no talk about what you know, most roofers have no retirement. Mm. They have no backup. Nope. I see guys that have fifty million dollar companies that don't own anything. And my buddy, you know, some of my friends that I talk to that are successful, they're diverse. And the thing I never understood, and this is something I've never done, is why would you just rely on the company to build a retirement? And, and I say this as a, somebody that's reaching a point where I'm a little, I'm probably 12 years older than my wife, not probably, I'm 12 years older than my wife. And what would your retirement be? Well, I've been working on that for a long time. I could, I could stop today. And the company could run it. And what, besides roofing, are you doing with your money to ensure that your family is taken care of? And are you building what's called generational wealth? Because this is where I'm at now. How do I build generational wealth for the kids, hmm. the people that I leave behind? Because that's what matters to me now. If you're asking me what matters sure. where the margins and all that, is it leaving them a company that does this much revenue? whether it's 50 million or 30 million or hundred million, or am I building generational wealth where, you know, they're not going to get left X amount. As a matter of fact, I think when your kids 30, 40 and 50, you know, as, as a person gets older, their, their idea of what to do with money is entirely different. Oh, hundred percent. No, I agree. hundred percent. Love it. Um, I changed my perspective, not only in the money, but on sizes. When I started uh, Storm storm group, I wanted like I was looking at fifty million dollar company and I want to beat them and then I I'm like you know what I'll beat them by reviews and it took me two years to beat them you know biggest company in town, but then I lost in, I lost passion I'm not a money driven person never have been and when I reached four or five million and I started traveling I'm like I want to do more of this I want to work five hours six hours a week for my roofing company and I want to do this and I did for three years I did this I, and and it was a great time wasn't it. Yeah, it was amazing time because when I find your passion, but it's uh, the greatest example that I've seen, and I've traveled to way over 100 companies, the greatest example who the smartest guy with his money and to answer this question is Eric Reno. The guy does five, six million a year, owns tons of real estate, extremely profitable. He's probably 20 net, net. So if he does five million, it's million bucks every year, invest every single penny of it. Right, so humble guy. I mean, yes, he's RV. He is like we all have our little toys and stuff. But you know, he doesn't have hundred million dollar yacht. But the guy could build fifty million dollar company if he wanted to. But he decided not to because, and he makes as much money as fifteen million dollar company. I it's, know it's interesting because you you did your roofing company, and I remember meeting you. I remember two years, three years later, we met, and you said, you know, Dan. I really want to do this. Mm -hmm. This this here was your passion. Mm -hmm. And I knew you were going to sell your company and do this. For me, my company is my passion. Mm -hmm. But I used my company since 07 is when I started investing in real estate. And uh, and and I've done pretty well. I, I, How many buildings do you have? I think we have over 200 and some doors. 200 buildings. Doors. Doors. What does it mean? Some of them are multi. It's easier to explain. So I have. I, I just finished uh, seven units. Unit. Units, units. Yeah. different. Some are single family homes. I have a lot of single family homes. Wow. You know, that's way to go. That's way to but, go. But, but you know, here there's, there's a solution there too. In the beginning, I would recommend if you're going to get into that, that you buy right. And, and, you know, I'm a big fan of owning. So, you know, I don't take until I, I, I feel I've deserved, I've earned it. So, Debt to ratio, if the economy collapsed, I prepared for that this year because I, with the interest rates going up and everything, um, even in my company, we tightened up. We didn't, I'm not going crazy this year on purchases and 
I'm not going crazy on investments this year. I'm, I'm going to see what happens this year, next two years, actually. The market? Yeah. We have a pretty good question. Uh, Redeem Roofing and Construction asking, please give some insights insight on your opinion of 1099 versus W2. I'm really wrestling with this. Thank you. So 1099 versus W2? Where do you live? <laughs> Where do you... you know, if you're in Texas, you can answer that question yourself almost. I used to believe, uh, here's what I believe now. Explain the Texas part. Well, just because they're, you know, more of a, it's like Colorado. Um, some areas, even the homeowners know that if they, they're not putting a roof on as easily unless there's a storm. So there's certain demographics in certain states that like Florida right now, they got probably six years of work and, and, and probably at least three other insurance companies going under. <laughs> we'll see. That's my opinion. But well, I, I think a 1099 versus a W-2 has to be a company decision at the top. Um, would I still use um, a 1099? Yeah, sure. If I get enough work, if I can't keep up, but they're going to have to conform to the way we do things. Meaning, mm. I, I, it's hard to make them accountable. It harder. is. It, it's harder. Uh, a W-2 to me, and I and I keep referring to it, is going to make less money than he would as a 1099. But he's going to have with us. He's going to have different benefits. Um, the 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 medical, um, the the, the retirement, the truck, and the phone, all that's covered by me. That, that well, not entire amount. They got to pay their premium and everything. But that's a different type of person. And I feel it commits them. I think that that person looks at the company as being part of their success. And, and with that, I feel that I need to provide them with a certain amount of leads and sales. And are they not going to want to be that? If I don't give them any leads, why would, you know, at all, why would they want to do that? They, they just wouldn't, you know, it, it's a balance. Got it. Um, Juan Angel is asking, he's saying he's starting, uh, I'm starting my roofing company. What's the proper way to set it? C corporation or sole proprietorship? Revenue. Um, that's a decision done by what numbers you're generating. Um, I would recommend, and, and, I, and, and I will recommend this, the two best people um, outside entities is your lawyer and your accountant. 100%. And both of those people should be meeting with you on a regular basis. I do not even buy a property or sell a property without talking to both those people. It's They will get upset with me if I do, because all that decisions are, are based on what happens in your company financially, um, especially your accountant. There's, there's two types. So if you, in your insurance, your insurance is huge because I remember when I first started one day I woke up and I, I, I didn't have 25,000 that I owed. And I learned real quickly that work comp, where we're at work comp is a killer. That's mm -hmm. very expensive, very expensive. hundred percent. And if you're not paying attention to your subs and other people, you could end up owing a lot of money. So it's very important that those positions are somebody that's going to sit down with you and say, and, and pre-plan it. So with your accountant and with your insurance company, you should be laying out the next year what your revenue is going to be and adjust what you're putting away so you don't have that happen to you. If you're running a million-dollar company and a storm comes to your neighborhood and you do $10 million, you're going to pay a lot. Mm -hmm. And if you're not taking some of that money as you're doing the jobs and tucking it away, it can be an issue. It, it can be a big issue. I've seen companies go under over that. Jim Brown is asking, is it ever appropriate to earn lower margins as you're scaling? No. <laughs> I don't. Here, here that, that's a, actually a good question. So we as a company have our salespeople required to try to hit certain margins. That's, that's what we do. Now, if you're a company and you're coming across an association with thousands of squares and, and, and the numbers are going to be different. So let's be honest. Mm -hmm. At least that's how we do. Anybody else that says they stay the same. Good for you. <laughs> we will adjust numbers. Um, some of that is because I warehouse, so there's a huge difference with buying power 
when I was smaller, I wasn't able to do some of the things I do now. But when you buy a container of felt, your margins fluctuate a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and your buying power with your distributor, by the way, no matter who it is, I'm not going to put one above the other. But your distributor should be coming to you multiple times a year. We meet them every, every at least two, two times a year, and we discuss what we're going to pay for material. How many price increases did you have this year? We had them, but they were later than most um, because we make agreements and we honor them. I expect my distributor to honor the agreement. Hmm. Um, now, I understand he's got to make money, too. That's the misconception. I'm going to switch and buy it from Menards. Good luck with that theory. But I think I would rather pay a little more and have a, have a distributor take care of me than, than to try and nickel and dime them. When you talk to your distributors, you, you, I could call my distributor right now. And if there's something I need, it's done. Not because I'm buying X amount from them, but because I've earned his respect. You know, it's a misconception, I think, there. Sometimes you got to, you know, it's a business. If I try to take every bit of profit my distributor is going to make, you know, but then I got friends that, that do that. So I, I'm i kind of, I'm very, very competitive. On that. Why you cannot buy directly from manufacturers? Why wouldn't they sell to bigger players who have warehouse, who can buy truckloads? Well, you could. It's just about how they, you... They, they, they wouldn't sell it. Not for long term. Maybe. What depends? Do you own a lumber company? <laughs> but because I know people that, you know, you could, you could. It's fair. Here's, here's it, why you don't do it, though. And, and I'm going to answer this because this is a good question. Sure. You could set up a corporation and, and, and sooner or later, the players in the neighborhood are going to get upset with you. You're going to piss everybody off. Really. Why? Well, the people that distribute, let's say the lumber company, the local lumber company, ABC or whoever. They're going to say, wait a minute, Menards, and they're going to go, you're selling to him and he's, he's getting a discount price. You know, that's eventually why. Buy in direct, I guess there's companies that probably do. I'm sure there is. I don't. Very little. Very I, I negotiate. So I, I'm a big fan of uh, if I buy, you know, 15,000 square as a number, then what could we look at for price increases when, you know, it's the bigger picture. Hmm. When you're buying a custom felt, it was an easy one. You know, I used to buy custom felt, but not the, but th that takes about a year to plan because it comes when it's shipped over in a container ship, it takes a while to get it put together. So I go through a distributor and they take care of that. I would rather have a good relationship with a distributor, whoever you choose, to where I can pick up the phone and say, I have a problem. And, and, and can you help me? It's not about the money all the time. You know, it's, you're, and, and, and we talked about this, me and you, the profitability on a job. Well, yeah, not every job's 37%, 37% of growth. It's just not. Some jobs you make more, some you make less. Do you calculate every job or do you? Yes. Every job. Every job. Everything we do. I can't even hire the company to do a project for my rentals without going through the company. Hmm. Nothing. We, you can't mix it. Is it a discipline or like, how did it? System. System. Systems. You have to have that in your system. AccuLinks or whatever CRM. Job Nimbus. Job Nimbus. <laughs> whatever CRM you pick, whatever thing you do, you have to track your number. You have to know your numbers. How would you at the end of the year know what you're going to, so like this year we're, we're coming up. I dread it, but yet I like it. And we'll sit down with a couple of the main people in the company and we're going to project what we want to sell and what profit we want to be. We're going to break down what it costs to open the door and how much money are we spending, you know, to, to get where we're at. We're going to do two more questions, guys, if you have it, and we're going to wrap it up. Tim Brown here is asking, at what level of revenue did you start investing in real estate? 07, we, we weren't as big as we are now. So I started, the, when 07 hit, if those of you that might be too young, I, I yeah. started around, um, there were houses in my area that were $100,000 homes going for twelve grand. 
wow. that were beat up and torn apart. Um, so I, and, and interestingly enough, generally speaking, you could get a house that was 50,000, say you paid 50 and it was a hundred thousand dollar house. And then you'd had to do a bunch of work because usually when that occurs, but that's when I started. Even now, if I see a good deal come, but it usually is related to construction. So I'll buy a house and rehab it. I just did a seven unit apartment complex. It was a, like a nursing home. And that was 30% over budget, wow. 30%, but I finished. I, I do think that if you're going to invest in real estate, you should do a, a minimum 20%. I, I would say 30% down because especially now is even harder because that controls your mortgage. So if you don't have enough money vested, your payment on the property, if it's empty, and there's a honey spot too. I think five to 10 properties helps cover you. That way you're not dependent if somebody moves. So if you own 10 houses and you have mortgages on seven of them and three people move, you're still probably going to be okay. You know, but if you own two houses and two people move, you got a problem. Absolutely. My last question is about uh, your closing rate and about follow-ups. Uh, you have pretty high closing rate. How many times your salespeople follow up and what's the process on the follow-up? I would love to say that it's always good. You know, anybody that says that is not telling the truth. I, we find out really quickly now if there's an issue. Um, we have a company that we hire to track us, like I said earlier. And so whether so that... How, how did they track you? They track everything we do in marketing. They track all incoming and outgoing calls. So if there's a missed call and it doesn't get put in the system, that call goes into it. And we, I get a notification on my phone that says that Mrs. Smith called. Third time she's called, Jason's not returning my phone calls. Hmm. Jason gets a phone call that day. We need a company for directory. I talked to the homeowner this morning. They called three companies from directory in Florida. And no one returned a phone call. I need to know when that's happening. Will they work with the director? I could find out. It's uh, There's a couple companies that do it because um, there are two different companies. The one that tracks the, the marketing and the, um, the stuff we do, they track down to how many hits. We can see how many hits an ad got, if it's a good ad or a bad ad or whatever. Mm -hmm. With the phone one, the company will track every single, you see it come through every, every let's say you have, you think you have a full-time person at your desk and that you got it covered. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. And There's those a, inefficiencies cost you a lot of money. When we leave the office at night, we turn the phones over to an answering service. If the answering service misses a call, the other company catches it. We, you need to know what's going on in your company and you don't, when you reach a certain level, you don't have the time no. to, to do that. What matters me to me more now is that I learn about the problem. Most of the time, the people that we have take care of the problem. If it reaches to me, when it finally gets to me is, is, is when then it's become a bigger problem. And then I'm, I'm pretty straightforward. I'm a nice guy, but I'm very blunt. If you're not returning your calls and you sell for me, we're going to have a conversation at some point. Do I need to take more leads from you? What is the deal? I'm going to ask, you know, but ultimately it, there's two reasons you're, 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 are you, why aren't you returning the call to where what's our, or him, where are you dropping the ball and how come? Love it. Absolutely. Love it guys. It was amazing. Almost two hours. We're going to wrap it up. Keep commenting questions. We'll get back to this later. Thank you, Dan, so much for coming. This guy has to drive a couple more hours on the snowy roads here. feel bad for you, but that was amazing. Thank I, I want to thank everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate it.